Sometimes providing power means lending a hand. So Energy sponsors free tax return assistance and financial education to help our customers take control of their future. Together, we power life. Energy. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you. I just want to see Melville come back. A new mayor works to revive a struggling Louisiana town. Algae produce not only bioplastic ingredient, but also making uh, um, drugs. An effort to create Mardi Gras beads that are green. Both can use for their uh, age and where what they've endured um, are in remarkably good condition. Unearthing relics and preserving important history for future generations. Hey everyone, I'm Andre Morrow. I'm Natasha Williams and welcome to this week's edition of SWI. We've got much more on those stories in a minute, but first, the Supreme Court has blocked a Louisiana law that opponents say could have left the state with only one doctor in one clinic to provide abortions. The vote was five to four. The Chief Justice John Roberts joining the court's four liberals to form a majority. That case is pending a full review. Right now, let's check on other stories making headlines across Louisiana. Mail delivery problems in Plaquemine have led to a resolution calling for the U.S. Postal Service to improve their customer service. The Advocate newspaper reports the resolution, adopted last month, is part of a long list of complaints levied against the Postal Service. Some of the complaints include mail not being delivered to customers for days, packages sometimes thrown from delivery trucks, and mail routinely delivered to the wrong addresses. As state agencies cut spending on services over the last decade, legislative offices still managed to sock away $85 million. But the money saved was never mentioned in budget hearings and only came to light this week with the release of the legislature's annual financial reports. The balances are not typically included in yearly legislative spending plans. The Port of New Orleans set a record for cruise ship passengers in 2018, the fifth straight year for the port to move more than a million travelers. The 1.2 million cruise passengers last year is a 2% increase from the year before. A recent study from LSU finds cruise passengers and ship crews spend almost $130 million locally each year. License plates are part of an effort to preserve a Louisiana lighthouse near the Texas state line. The Lake Charles American Press reports that buying Sabine Pass Lighthouse plates will help raise money to restore the structure. The lighthouse has cracks that need repair. It's been in use since 1857. Bossier City officials say water samples have tested negative for a brain-eating amoeba for the second time since October. They released the test results Monday. It's been four months since tests found the brain-eating amoeba in the Bossier City portion of the Sligo water system. The CDC says an infection from the amoeba can happen when someone goes swimming in warm freshwater lakes and rivers. The infection usually starts by entering the nose, not from drinking. More than 50% of the state's public water systems are more than 50 years old, and on the list of the 10 worst is Melville and St. Landry Parish. We took a trip to Melville to talk to town leaders and residents about the fix that will, is urgently needed to avoid a water crisis in a town that has seen much better days. Velma Durasol Hendricks was born and raised in Melville. We definitely don't have the money to get the things that are necessary for good living. Hendricks was elected mayor in November. The 80-year-old retired school teacher says she felt a sense of obligation. I am accustomed to Melville having certain things and we no longer have them. 
And I just want to see Melville come back to where it once was. The town no longer has a bank. It closed a few months ago. The gas station also closed up shop, as well as a number of corner stores. We had public schools here. We no longer have a public school. We had a pharmacy. We no longer have the pharmacy. The small town nestled in the northern part of St. Landry Parish along the Atchafalaya River is struggling. Now we do have uh, a health service. This is um, Med Express. I think if we could get some industry here, we could bring the citizens back. A recent census says the town population has dropped to 1,041 and adding to the list of problems Melville faces, a recent report has placed the town on the governor's list of 10 worst drinking water systems in the state. Like many small communities, Melville can't afford to maintain or make improvements to their 60-year-old drinking water system. We only have one small well that's operating, mm -hmm. and we need the large well and use the small well as our backup. In the past, well, Melville was known for having one of the best water systems or the best water that you could possibly consume. But over time, with the types of pipes that was placed in the ground, these galvanized pipes, they began to deteriorate. Willie Haynes III served three terms as mayor of Melville and says getting the new water system up and running is important for another reason, too. With a new system, uh, it will be more upgraded, whereas you could keep uh, a count of household that's using the water. Because that's a problem now, because some people don't pay for water. No. Uh, there have been situations where uh, customers was terminated because of lack of payment, mm -hmm. uh, whereas the front portion of the house was cut off. Mm -hmm. but the back still water was being uh, used. Haynes says even if and when the town's old water system is replaced, a lot more needs to be done. We're going to just have to get involved more with our area legislators, our senators, our representatives. They must look at us here in this area. We vote for them. We need them as much as they need us. Yeah, we're excited about getting the grant um, so that we're assured of um, uh, quality water. Grant Canatelli agrees. His family owns Melville's only grocery store. So they're getting this grant, $4.3 million, um, and a loan along with it. It's essential for the town to grow, right? Yes, absolutely. I mean, because um, I mean, basically if you lose your water, you, you, um, we don't have much left now, but um, you know, we definitely don't want to lose water and the quality and reliability of our water. Canatelli says his business has suffered in recent years and is hoping improvements in the water system and in other areas will turn their town around. We're trying everything we can to keep the doors open and um, it's really a struggle um, um, being in a small community uh, with just not a lot of resources. Uh, our citizens just don't have a lot of extra income to spend. Michael Clark says the new water meters that come with the new water system could be the start of an economic boost the town needs. You're paying a flat rate now, but water meter is going to say if you don't use so much water, then your bill is going to be cheap, you know what I'm saying? And it's going to help because people don't want to fix their leaks here in town. If you have water meters, then they're going to get their leaks fixed because they don't want the water meter to continue running. But Clark, who served on the town council for two years, recently resigned and believes fixing the water system is only part of the solution. He says town officials have to spend the money that's coming in wisely. Bills not being, you know, taken care of, you know, and, you know, just, it wasn't good, you know. When I sit on the board, we never really had statements in front of us. So, I mean, it's kind of hard to do anything when you never have statements in front of you, bank statements, anything like that. So, I mean, and that's one of the reasons why I left, because I couldn't make a decision if I didn't have nothing in front of me to make a decision with. New Mayor Velma Hendrick is planning lots of changes, starting with laying out the good, bad, and even the ugly on council tables for all the residents to see. She wants to turn her hometown around and keep it going in the right direction. You come into this job, three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars in the hole. Yes. So I plan to make some type of arrangement with the companies mm -hmm. that we can pay, you know, so much per month mm -hmm. and get those bills paid off. Help me see what Melville will look like in five years. Melville will be clean the personal properties, the ditches, 
there will be a service station, there will be a pharmacist, uh, there will be corner groceries, and just a beautiful place. Now, a study done by the Environmental Protection Agency in 2011 estimated that it would cost taxpayers $5.3 billion to fix the state's crumbling drinking water infrastructure. You look at some of those numbers there, they're staggering. Mardi Gras produces tons of fun. It also produces tons of trash. And all those plastic beads and trash wind up taking up more and more space in landfills. But researchers at LSU are working on a way to make Mardi Gras beads and trinkets green, biodegradable. Where do they stand in their efforts? We talked with the lead researcher on the project. The season that often defines Louisiana is upon us. Carnival season, Mardi Gras, often called the greatest free party on earth. Crowds that number in the many tens of thousands will line up along parade routes, hands in the air, shouting to be thrown any number of the plastic trinkets and beads that the crews, the riders on the floats, hurl their way. When the party's over, what's left is a massive cleanup, and all those plastic beads and trash head to landfills. At the Life Sciences Building on the campus of LSU, inside a series of small labs, a team is at work on a process to make Mardi Gras beads and doubloons that won't add to landfill waste problems. Beads that are green. Green because the key ingredient to make these biodegradable Mardi Gras trinkets is algae. Louisiana is one of the best places in mainland U.S. to grow the algae. Dr. Nauhiro Kato believes he's in the right place at the right time. He's developed a way to grow this microscopic algae, harvest it, and process it into a powder that can then form beads and doubloons. Then, after the fun is over, these celebratory throws will break down naturally in soil in about one or two years. The process involves using the oil that comes from algae, which is similar to the oil that comes from other plants and vegetables. Actually, scientists found actually algae accumulate or make oil more than plants can do. So actually, it's not my finding. I already know for years or years algae can make oil. Okay, so then question becomes, okay, how I can make a plastic from that algae we harvested? And then there's known that if you put something, uh, a little bit chemicals, and then what's happening, starch and oil, actually we call it cross link, which means, you know, joined together. Yes. So what, I'd say, okay, just put a little bit of the chemicals, and then the, basically the manually hold it, that, the algae, and then just leave it. And the next day, it's very hard. The plastic exactly look like a Mardi Gras piece. I can create it. A grant from the LSU Board of Supervisors is funding the research to help make this cross-linking process possible. Bigger batches of algae have moved from the lab to these storage tanks near LSU's baseball stadium. If things go according to plan, this summer, the project will move off campus to a private Louisiana-based company. It's there that the combination of algae and other natural materials will be used to create the first run of biodegradable Mardi Gras beads. This company expects to create about 3,000 beads. And what else is needed? Machines and land, like a rice field or crawfish pond. Size or depth is very suitable to grow the algae. So that we need, the way a place we, we culture. We also need a machine to harvest it because algae is just tiny, tiny creatures. So we need something special machine to harvest it. Kato says he has the special machines and the land, but the cost is an issue. Right now, there's no profit margin in the creation of biodegradable beads. But there is a tremendous profit to be made in other uses of algae. Algae produce not only bioplastic ingredient, 
but also making uh, uh, drugs and you know, food supplement. Same time, the same cells. Those same algae cells used for food supplements, Kato says, do demand a premium price and profit margin. From same algae we grow, we can extract these drugs and uh, uh, food supplement fast, then to sell it to make a profit, then use leftover materials to make exactly the same biodegradable molecular bees. I think if it could ever be cost effective, uh, it would work. Nelson Maddox, owner of Party Start here in Baton Rouge, makes his living selling beads and trinkets in huge numbers. He's all for anything that would be good for the environment, but knows there will always be a bottom line. I think as a majority across the board for Mardi Gras, people buy price. And it's price, price, price. We will check back this summer to take a look at that first run of beads and follow the progress on the beads that are green. It has been about eight months since the discovery of a second ancient dugout canoe in Louisiana. Meticulous restoration efforts are currently underway. But it will likely be another two and a half years before the relics are ready for the public to see them. LPB's Charles Jones has that story. It was back in June of 2017 when two local residents discovered a partially buried canoe on the bank of the Red River near Shreveport. With Tropical Storm Cindy on the horizon, Dr. Chip McGimsey says time was of the essence to save the canoe. The projections, early projections, were that there could be somewhere between four to eight inches of rain in the Shreveport area, and we knew the Red River was going to rise a lot if that happened, and we were afraid it would refloat the canoe off the bank, and it would drift down river, and we might not ever see it again. So what had been sort of a leisurely process to figure out how to accomplish those three goals became something that had to be done the next day. Less than a year later, another canoe was found near Bayou Lafouche, this time, Jamie Ponville made the discovery while using a backhoe. As he says, he's always been interested in American Indian stuff and watches lots of things on the TV, and he just knew that he'd found something. So he hopped down and with a shovel, and as he says, within five minutes, he knew he'd found part of a canoe. Both canoes were taken to the Conservation Research Laboratory, or CRL, at Texas A&M in College Station, Texas, where efforts to preserve the canoes are underway. Dr. Peter Fix, director of the CRL, says he was shocked at the state of the canoes when they arrived. Both canoes for their uh, age and where what they've endured um, are in remarkably good condition. Uh, each one has its different uh, issues and challenges regarding stabilization. Since the canoes are made of wood, an organic material that decays easily, Dr. Fix says they must undergo a drastic transformation before being displayed. So what we have to do is slowly over time uh, put a chemical into a vat, uh, which is polyethylene glycol. It's a synthetic wax that will enter into the cell structure and around the cell structure. Uh, and that will displace the water that is actually in the wood. So when we go to uh, remove the remaining water, uh, we can control that dehydration process and the wood will remain in, the sh in that particular shape. He also says because of their size, the Shreveport canoe at 34 feet and the one in Donaldsonville at 11 feet, the restoration process could be a long one. The, the documentation uh, lasts about uh, six months the uh, impregnation of the polyethylene glycol will take about two years. It has to be a slow process, wait to wait, and then as the water evaporates out, we'll put more polyethylene glycol in. While three years may seem like a long time, when compared to how old the canoes are, it's just a drop in the bucket. So we sent off a sample of the wood uh, to a lab to get dated, um, and it tells us that the tree died somewhere between um, 1300 and 1420 AD. So the canoe almost certainly dates somewhere in the 13 to 1400s, early 1400s AD. 
This time frame, around 600 years ago, means that the Shreveport Canoe was almost certainly made by the Caddo tribe. And Dr. McGimsey says the Donaldsonville Canoe is even older. The Bayou Lafouche Canoe, um, again, we dated it, um, and I don't remember the exact numbers on the dates, but it's about 1,500 years old, um, which is the oldest dated canoe we have here in Louisiana. It will be a couple of years before the canoes hit museum floors. Where they will be displayed hasn't been set in stone yet, but once they are, both Dr. Fix and Dr. McGimsey say these canoes will offer an important look into our nation's past. So this, there's a significance there, there's a connection. Uh, it's, it's great to be helping out Louisiana uh, that we have these, this facility here, um, and it helps keep us going, obviously. It's a way of really making the past alive for people. That's what makes canoes special. So history lovers, be on the lookout for these canoes to hit the museums for a fascinating viewpoint into the lives of the early tribes of Louisiana. For LPB, I'm Charles Jones. Now talks are continuing between several tribes and the state to decide where those canoes should eventually be on display. Now, as we celebrate Black History Month, we want to take you to the Epps House in Alexandria. It is central to the story of Solomon Northup, whose life was the basis for the Oscar-winning movie, 12 Years a Slave. This house was owned by Edwin and Malvina Epps on by Beth here in central Louisiana, and it was built by, of course, the labor of their enslaved persons, one of whom was Solomon Northup. Uh, he was an enslaved person who'd been kidnapped and sold into slavery, and he'd been living here uh, with Mr. Epps for about, I believe, eight, nine years by that point, probably nine, closer to 10, uh, he, he was here for a total of 12 years. And in building this house, he came into contact with the architect uh, in this Creole style, uh, Mr. Samuel Bass from Canada. Samuel Bass, he was an abolitionist, and uh, he and Northup got to talking. Northup told him about his family in New York. Mr. Bass helped him write and then smuggle letters to Northup's family in New York so that they knew exactly where he was. They knew he was enslaved. He had been gone nearly 12 years at this point. Bass was able to get those letters of Northup's up to Northup's family, uh, and a member uh, associated with the family was able to come down and present a case. They, it was a legal case. They tried it in the courthouse in Marksville, Voiles Parish Courthouse, and able to um, ensure eventually uh, Mr. Northup's return to freedom. But if Mr. Epps hadn't decided to build himself a new house and had not included Mr. Bass, then Northup and Bass would not have met. Maybe Northup never would have re-obtained his freedom. He may have died here in slavery and obscurity. So it's really quite an important piece of Mr. Solomon Northup's story. The map was created by a former professor, Dr. Sue Egan, and a Rapids Parish surveyor, Rufus Smith. And they created a map to show the footsteps of Mr. Northup as he was here in Louisiana. So you can follow the footsteps that he took. This map is it's a beloved artifact uh, here in central Louisiana because it shows so much of our history here. Uh, Director Steve McQueen picked up the book and started reading it and fell in love with Northup's narrative and realized what a, uh, it would make a good movie and he was correct. The movie is as good as the book. I teach Louisiana history every semester. I always use 12 Years a Slave as one of the readings for several reasons, one of which is that Solomon Northup was a free man and he knew what that meant when he lived in New York and suddenly all of that was taken away from him. So he could make comparisons that someone who grew up in slavery might not be able to make. And then secondly, it's important because it tells us the story of slavery from the slave's perspective. And we have very, very few of those because slaves weren't able to read and write. The owners quite often made sure that they weren't able to read and write. They couldn't leave behind the records, the letters, the diaries that the plantation owners left for us. We can know their side of the story. Solomon Northup tells us the slave's side of the story. The Epps House, Solomon Northup's Gateway to Freedom, is open weekly Thursday through Sunday from 12.30 to 4.30 p.m. Admission is free. You can find out more information at lsua.edu Epps House. 
Now, here is something that fans of the iconic <laughs> Mr. Rogers will love. Saturday night at 7 will feature the LPB premiere of Won't You Be My Neighbor. The documentary looks back at the legacy of Fred Rogers and his radically kind ideas. And during the broadcast, you'll have an opportunity to join LPB's Be A Friend campaign. That's tomorrow night, February 9th at 7 o'clock on LPB. Murphy Neal Jones Sr., a Baton Rouge native, former Tulane football player and Vietnam War hero, has died at the age of 81. He was an Air Force pilot whose fighter bomber was shot down in North Vietnam in 1966, and then he went on to endure more than six and a half years as a prisoner of war. He, has survived, he survived the torture and was then eventually released in 1973. He later became director of development for Tulane Athletics, and in the year 2016, the Colonel Murphy Neal Jones All-American Wall was dedicated to honor his service and sacrifice. Colonel Jones is survived by his wife of more than 60 years. And everyone, that is our show for this week. Remember, you can watch LPB On Demand on your phone or tablet with our LPB Anywhere app. The download is free at your app store. You can catch LBB News as well as public affairs shows as well as other Louisiana programs you've come to enjoy over the years. Please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For all of us here at Louisiana Public Broadcasting, I'm Andre Morrow with Natasha Williams. Thanks so much for watching us. Until next time, that's the state we're in. Sometimes providing power means lending a hand. So Energy sponsors free tax return assistance and financial education to help our customers take control of their future. Together, we power life. Energy. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana and the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you.